and there was so much going on, but I really don't know what all. Mm -hmm. What was it like for you that night? Right. But that day, I even had to go to work after I, I didn't want to go to work, but I thought, oh, gee. And the work was only in um, a restaurant job downtown. But on the subway, it was the first time I had heard this happen where they announced it on the subway that Malcolm X, the great black leader, was shot. I don't know if they said he was killed, but they said he was shot. And you could see all the people in the subway just stunned, too. And then as soon as I got to work, it was a Japanese restaurant, I told my boss, I said, something horrible happened. And she had already heard on the, everybody, you know, I guess, had heard on the uh, well, TV or radio or what. And, and then she said, look, if you want to leave, you could leave early, and I think I left early. Do you regret your relationship with Malcolm X? Did I what? Regret. Regret? Oh, my goodness, no. I will be forever grateful that he came into my life. My goodness, he's changed my life. I understand that only one meeting of the OAAU took place after Malcolm's death. Uh, did you, were you at that meeting and what took place? There was only one OAU meeting? This is what I, this is uh, information that I came across. This well, there may have been, yourself. I did not make a lot of the OAU meetings, but I did make, well, what, but I was more with the group that was going to the, well, when, right after Malcolm was killed, somebody said they're going to have to um, close the liberation school. But no one wanted the school closed. And so then they decided that they were going to hold these meetings in private, in, in people's apartments. And there was one sister's apartment that we held, held meetings after that. And, and then, though, there came a time where um, at the liberation school group that James Campbell, the teacher, we were all sitting in the room and said that we are going to have to ask people to leave this group if they have had close relationship with James Shabazz. And I was sort of surprised. And they asked each of us, they went around to say, what was your relationship with James Shabazz? And then on that, they would tell us which ones could stay and which ones couldn't. And I told them about uh, Students Against Social Injustice. My kids were in that group, and he spoke to them to help raise money and stuff. And, uh, and he said, well, I'm sorry. I think you have a close relationship with James Shabazz or something. So I was one of them that was knocked out of the group. I don't know who, who else was knocked out, who were able to stay in and who wasn't, but I know he had told me I could. But now, strange, you know, like 35 years, 30 years had passed. And a few years ago, James Campbell, now this is not James Shabazz, James Campbell. James Campbell was in town, and he called me, and he said, hey, do you have any time we could have lunch? And I had been wanting all these years, 30 years, to ask him why he, he got rid of me then. And so. When we met at, I don't know, it was at uh, near Columbia University uh, at the Red Bank School or something, we went to the cafeteria. And I said, James, for years I wanted to ask you something. And I've only seen you one other time, and it wasn't the place to ask you. And the one other time was when uh, Kimako, when uh, Baraka's sister was killed, and I was at the funeral there. And he was there. Of course, that was no time to ask him a question like that. So I said, I want to ask you about that whole thing around, you know, you had each of us ask us our relationship to James Shabazz, and then you told me, I'm sorry, but you won't be able to keep coming, that there's some feeling about James. Um, and, and so I just, you know, left the group after that. You know, I was surprised. He said, I don't remember anything like that. And, but I, I'm sure he was not lying. He was being honest. He said, I don't remember. He said, you mean 
I asked everybody in the class a question like that. He said, do you know, I'm, I'm, and, and I know he wasn't trying to lie or anything. He said, I really don't remember. And so. It's amazing how a person's life can be changed from the actions of a person for a couple of moments and then mm -hmm. a person not even remember it. Sometimes oh. people don't realize the impact they have on other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but this is, I, I love James Campbell, and because he, I have hardly met a teacher like him, and I don't think there was any reason for him to squeeze out of answering, and he and he had good. I'm sure it would have been he would have good reasons that to say that. Well, there were some things that seemed questionable, or but he said, no, I don't really remember. He said, I don't even remember the incident where I asked everybody to give their, you know, relationship to James Sh uh, Shabazz. And from, from that, that started the rumor about he might have been involved from that incident with this other James mentioning uh, James Shabazz? Oh, no, I don't know. Oh, wait, no, I don't think so. But it's just that I was surprised that James Campbell mm -hmm. didn't remember that, that he incident. Those things. But uh, no matter what, it would not take away for me, my strong, more than respect that I had for James Campbell, unless he felt too, maybe he didn't want to bring back some old, what do you call it, that could you know, open wounds or whatever, yeah, or, or a can of worms would start coming out, or I don't know. But uh, because I wonder too, I wonder which ones he allowed to stay, which ones he let go, you know, but he said, he just didn't remember. I don't know if this should be in. Okay, we'll just. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What What immediate impact did Malcolm's execution have on his followers? I think it did two things. I don't think it frightened his followers. I think more so, they realized how much more important Malcolm was, that he was singled out for that kind of treatment, that Malcolm must have been a danger to certain people. And I'm sure he was more of a danger to the US government than he was to the NOI. Uh, I think what was sad was I think NOI was heavily infiltrated. And they were able to use the people in, um, in that group, those who might have been a little bit jealous of Malcolm or maybe fighting for power within the group for position or what, that uh, I think those who were really part of the FBI or CIA, they just kept, you know, uh, exploiting it. And I think this is what was so sad. But uh, uh, back again to that, what his assassination or execution, oh shucks. You can answer that, sister. Okay, sister. Oh. Were the Harlem streets swept clean of young street activists prior to Malcolm's assassination? There's some rumors that they were an arrest of people they considered to be youthful agitators and that about three days prior to Malcolm's assassination that they were uh, taken off the streets by the New York City Police Department. Oh, wow, I didn't even know that. But this isn't surprising. I'm sure that even before Malcolm was killed, I think even, you know, when I told you that, I thought when Walter Bow, Bob Collier, and Khalil, you know, I mean, they took three guys who could have protected him that they knew martial arts and they knew, I think, how to use weapons. I mean, look how they, they were taken off the streets. But I think they've been trying to take people off the streets for months prior to, I mean, well, I mean, f but I think from the time that Malcolm bouldered from the Nation of, of Islam, it was very hazy who was what and where. You know, it, it was hard to tell who were the main enemies or who were even, what do you call it, 
pulled into become co becoming collaborators. Um, but I think that a lot of, uh, I think as many admirers that Malcolm had and his acclaim from so many areas and circles, yet I don't think any of us really realized how great a man he was. Uh, and I think it's way after he was killed that more and more as people analyzed a lot of things, they saw his, the connection with, oh, I mean, all, all the way to liberation struggles in the third world. Or, and then we, we, maybe this isn't the place to put it, but one of the things he said here, it's too bad we didn't have a, 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 we didn't tape him when he was here. But one of the things he said, now this is, he spoke in June of 1964. The anti-Vietnam War movement hadn't really begun yet. But he said something to the effect that the struggle of Vietnam is the struggle of all third world people. Africa, Asia, and Latin America, meaning struggle against imperialism, struggle against colonialism, neo-colonialism. I mean, he was so far ahead. And, and even the statement that he made, it was in a poster that the struggle of Vietnam is struggle third world. Well, can you imagine how the U.S. government or eventually they would see that, you know, the police are everywhere, they would catch a leaflet like that. I mean, they could see how dangerous Malcolm would be to them. And anyway, wherever Malcolm spoke in Africa and the Middle East, he was opening the minds of the people there to the struggle here in America. And he was bringing the two struggles together and, and telling it like it is, who is the number one enemy, the real enemy? And I think the U.S. government, I'm sure, must have thought, hey, this guy's got to go. Yeah. It is um, known among some of Malcolm's closest aides from his Nation of Islam days forward that he had an impeccable moral character, especially yes. with women. Yes. That there were women actually sent into the mosque uh, to test his character, mm -hmm. sent by not only the government, but street hustlers as well. Mm -hmm. uh, if there's anything you, could you speak to this? Yeah, well, I mean, anyone can see that Malcolm was uh, not just of impeccable character, but as a, as a man, he was such a supremely attractive man, and uh, the kind of man that any woman would like, like to have. There's so few men, I think, that could be placed on that same level. And yet, I think he absolutely he had an impeccable moral, what do you call it, moral spirit in him that he never wavered. Uh, once he became, went into the nation of Islam, he, he, he was a straight arrow. And I think that's the reason why he was so disappointed that his leader, Elijah, did not follow suit. And I think he knew that a lot of people were going to criticize him, but I think he felt he had to be honest. And because he felt that if you're going to say something, if you don't live up to it, I mean, what's the sense of having such you know, high principles? And I think he knew when he criticized Elijah, it might have been the beginning of the end for him. I don't know, but he was... I, he was one in a million. I mean.